The tide keeps rolling, west to east. El Nino is building, and it will not be stopped. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, May 14th. Storm surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. And if you want to make a small donation to the cause, hit the button down below, the special thanks button, the heart with the dollar sign in it. Give us a tip. We appreciate it. It keeps our operations ongoing. And with that, I'd like to make mention of folks that donated from last week. Sporeman, Jason, thank you so much. Coach Nate, again, great. Mike Schwartz, thank you very much. Big donation. Tim Caston, Elliot Harris, Rosemary Hill, we appreciate your contributions. It means a lot to us. And with that, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean. We see remnants of a gale in the far southeast Pacific outside and east of the Southern California swell window, producing 24, 25 foot seas, targeting uh, Peru, Chile, up into Central America. Swell is heading that direction. And some energy from this earlier incarnation of the system is pushing up in towards Southern California, but not a whole lot. We also see a gale under Australia producing 35, 36 foot seas, but we'll look at the forecast. You can see high pressure starting to ridge south under New Zealand, likely going to squash most of that energy. All right, let's get into the details. First up, current conditions. We'll start in Northern California. Point Reyes buoy number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy from anywhere out to 33.3 seconds. Super long period energy, which effectively there is none. The whole way down to five second period, just pure on pretty much unsurfable wind chop. We see a bump at 14 seconds. That is some northwest swell. We see some 12 point, another bump at 12.5 seconds. That is southern hemi swell. We see a bunch of wind swell in the nine second period range and so it's kind of a convoluted mix of energy we we'll try to pull out the main swell and it, the biggest is four feet 13.3 seconds from 275 degrees that's that bump right there uh, that would make surf at about five feet and actually there's probably waves even a little bit bigger than that so there is surf Next up, we go to Southern uh, Point in Northern California, Santa Cruz, buoy number 254. This filters out some of the northwest swell. You can see there's a bump here at 18 seconds, another bump at like 13 seconds. And again, the same sort of smattering of uh, wind swell and everything all mixed together, though most of this is Southern Hemi swell. And you can see here, primary swell 1.5 feet at 17.2 seconds from 199 degrees. That would put surf theoretically at two and a half feet, but it is bigger than that. It's probably in the shoulder to almost head high range. And then there's secondary swell, sort of that fading remnants of a previous southern hemi swell, 2.2 feet, 11.7 seconds from 232 degrees. So that's off. It's more like 200 or less. And again, like waist high surf from that. Next, we go down to Southern California, Point Loma Buoy South, number 191 off of San Diego there. We're not even looking north because anything north of there, you know, the Channel Islands just pretty much blocks it when you get into the northern half of Southern California. We see a nice little bump here at about 16.7 seconds. That is new arriving Southern Hemi Swell. And then, again, that whole smattering of energy, though all this stuff in the 13, 14 second period range is all additional Southern Hemi Swell. Uh, Pulling it all together, primary swell, 2.8 feet at 16.7 seconds from 187 degrees. Surf from that would be 4.6 feet. There are definitely bigger sets than that. Just saw about a 10-wave set hit a uh, select spot in Southern California, well overhead. And so the new swell is coming. Then over to Hawaii, North Shore, Waimea Bay buoy number 106. Yes, it's up and operating, and there is swell. Nice bump here at about 12 and a half seconds with some northeast uh, wind swell mixed in. Primary swell, 4.9 feet at 12.3 seconds from 337 degrees. That would put surf at 6.1 foot Hawaiian, and probably a couple feet overhead is a pretty good estimate for what's going on. 
And then over on the South Shore at Barber's Point buoy number 238, we see a bunch of energy at like 14, 13 seconds all in there. A lot of that, I suspect, is really northwest swell wrapping around into the South Shore with just a little bit of Southern Hemi energy mixed in. Primary swell supposedly 2.9 feet at 13.1 seconds from 205 degrees. I think that's a bit suspect with surf supposedly at 3.8 foot Hawaiian. It's nowhere near that big. So take this one with a grain of salt. So where did all this surf come from? Let's go take a look. First in the northern hemisphere, a little gale developed here off the Kamchatka and northern Kuril Islands on Tuesday, May 9th. Pushed over the north dateline with about 26 foot seas on Wednesday. Thursday, that gale fell into the Gulf of Alaska, got reinforced, started generating Oh, well, there's 20-foot seas right there. Uh, this is 20.2-foot seas, the highest seas over this entire image. And here's their exact location, roughly right there. Um, and you can see 20-foot seas building to 21 feet on Friday, aimed well at Hawaii here and the U.S. West Coast. On Saturday, that system started fading. You can see the swell hitting the islands and also moving into California. We'll go right into Sunday, but the system pretty much has faded. Then we go down to the southern hemisphere uh, on May 7th, going back in time, a gale developed here in the south central Pacific, built with 35 foot seas. Uh, let's see, let's go back two more images. Yep, 35 foot seas, that was the peak of it on Sunday, last Sunday evening while we were doing the video. And that system then pushed north and started fading. Swell from this system is currently just starting to hit Southern California. That's what we saw on the Southern Cal buoy there, the 191. And then another system developed from the remnants of that on Wednesday with, let's see, we got about 33 foot seas building to 36 foot on Wednesday evening and one little reading to 37 feet. Now, uh, Northern California is at about 122 west. If you do the math and actually figure out the swell uh, uh, angle from this, that would come in at about right at 180 to maybe 179 and a half degrees into Northern California. So you got to find some unprotected spot or unshadowed spot. But for Southern California, just fine because the cutoff there is at about 117 degrees. The system then pushed north into Thursday evening and Friday and moved out of even the Southern California swell window. After that, one more gale developed again in the far Southeast Pacific. All this pretty much cuts out Hawaii. You get, we had uh, right again on the hairy edge of the swell window, even for Southern California. What was that? We'll go back there. It was uh, 31 feet, aimed somewhat to the north. So, so a small little system from that. And then there we are. Now, you notice there is energy that could be, in fact, let's just go plow through this. We're going to look for Hawaii. We're just looking in this window here for anything that could push up through the Fiji Channel and provide some hope for swell and really not a whole lot. We're right to Sunday now and this system probably provides the best hope but most of the energy falling southeast not aimed up through the Tasman Sea so probably no hope there. So that's the discussion of swell that's either in the water pushing towards us or hitting, uh, be it either Hawaii or California right now. Now let's look for the next week ahead and see if there's any opportunity for more to develop. So we'll start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales. When they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a push in the jet to north. And you kind of see it right there. What that would do is help create a clockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. Clockwise in the southern hemisphere is the sign of low pressure. Of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough, get traction on the ocean surface and generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, eventually turn into swell. Swell and hit your beach turns into surf. So we have a little trough here, and this is the remnant trough from that previous gale that was somewhere right here on the hairy edge of the Southern California swell window. But in general, winds here pushing to the south. We're not seeing anything. And you can see it's pushing to the southeast. And that, that's called a ridge. When you get this split flow like this, you get high pressure in between and high pressure does nothing for generating meaningful swell other than wind chop and that's not going to make because the period would be too slow on wind chop it would not survive 
the uh, travel time up to the northern hemisphere. So we're just writing this off. We're into already Tuesday, Wednesday, the 17th of May. This ridging pattern continues. Yes, there is a trough forecast here for the far southeast Pacific, but California again, Southern California, right there at about 118, 117 west. This is even out of there. So if anything forms here, it's for Chile, Peru, and Central America. And that trough even is gone by Thursday. And again, we get even more of a ridge pushing down into Antarctica. I'm not sure where the ice line is, but I'm guessing it's about 68 south, something like that, and going to start slowly building to the north. So we're out to Saturday, five days from now. Look at that ridge pushing all the way down into Antarctica. Another one of these far southeast Pacific troughs developed about a week out, again offering hope for Peru and Chile, but not a whole lot for the U.S. West Coast, and there we are a week from now and nothing. So get whatever you can get while you can. So let's go take a look down at the ocean surface. This is uh, uh, with surface level pressure, surface level winds, and as expected, yes, there is fetch under New Zealand, all aimed southeast down in Antarctica. Other than that, we need pretty much at least 40 knot winds. That would be this sort of dark orange color. There's 35. Don't see anything in uh, the Amer U.S. or South America, Central America swell window at the moment. Again, we're into Monday night, Tuesday. A little bit of a fetch here, but sweeping just due west to east. That's maybe good for Chile and Peru, but not the U.S. West Coast. There you go. It starts pushing a little bit to the north as we get into Tuesday. But, again, pretty much outside, east of the California swell window. We know there's a trough there. This will be good for Chile up into Peru. Now, only 35 knot winds, but still, it's close enough there that it will not decay way to nothing. We get into Friday, still nothing. Uh, little system here, 45 knot winds as we get into late Friday night. Actually lifting to the northeast, so maybe there is some hope here. And then south winds as we get into Saturday. This is almost a week from now. And in the California swell window. Oh, building to 50 knots. So this is an upgrade from the last time we looked. Uh, getting into Sunday. Again, one of these barely in the southern California swell window. And then taking off targeting Peru and Chile and Central America, and that is the end of that. So there is a note of caution. That energy is still five days out, so not sure how much I believe the models just yet, and a lot of it is a recent appearance on the models. So uh, again, low confidence right now. What is the effect of those winds on the ocean surface? Well, right now, we effectively have a non-functional swell-producing sea state in the southern hemi. Again, we're looking for seas. Well, there's a little pocket of 28-foot seas, but again, aimed off to the east and fading quick. Probably nothing from that, but as soon as it gets out of the Southern California swell window, it starts building up. 30-foot seas, nothing huge, not over a large area, but certainly some swell for Peru and Chile. That one fades out. We're looking for anything else. Then here comes the next system on Saturday. In fact, we're going to rewind this a bit to, there we go, fri late Friday night, the 19th of May. 31-foot seas pushing east, and then right is about the time it gets to the the hairy edge of the uh, California swell window. It starts building with seas to, what is that, 30, 32, 30, probably 36 feet, but just barely in the swell window, building to 38 feet, but out of even the southern California swell window, targeting Chile and Peru quite well, and aimed Broad fetch area aimed well to the north. Certainly, if this materializes, large swell could result for, we'll say, Chile up into Peru and even Central America uh, and maybe some of Mexico. Kind of hard to say at this early date. And then just for fun, a quick look at the northern hemisphere. It's very late in the season. We're looking. There's a little gale here forecast on Tuesday north of Hawaii with 18-foot seas, so maybe some wind swell for exposed north shores on the Hawaiian Islands. You can see, watch the swell front here as it approaches. So that looks like it'd be maybe on a Thursday thing. Another gale off Japan, probably of tropical origin, but it's not supposed to do much. Another little system producing, what is this? This is 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13-foot seas. That's 
14. Oh, okay. 14 and a half foot seas on Saturday. Maybe something for the Pacific Northwest, but probably not. It also looks like wind swell building as we get into next weekend along the California coast. Local wind forecast. Now, what we're really hoping for is not to see strong north winds, we'll say south of um, San Francisco. North of San Francisco, it's pretty typical this time of year. You get this gradient thing going on where you get a low pr heat pressure inland and high pressure over the Gulf of Alaska generates a gradient and north winds, and that gets wind swell into north and central California. But when it gets too far south of uh, San Francisco, Santa Cruz area, it start, that starts feeding. If you get the northwest winds along the coast, then that starts that upwelling machine. And actually, right now, water temperatures are decent and respectable from San Francisco southward. We don't want to see another bout of strong north winds. So uh, on Sunday, we'll just do this real quick. We have a light like south flow for the California coast, which is nice. Trades a little bit too much out of the north east, uh, east for Hawaii, but not unmanageable. The south wind ed light eddy flow continues as we get into Monday for California with uh, northeast to easterly trades for Hawaii. Low pressure north of the Hawaiian Islands again generating winds while we think that'll be in on what about Thursday. Get a light northwest flow on Tuesday for north and central California 10 knot. East trades 10 knots for Hawaii. So we get into Wednesday pretty much the same regime nothing changing. Thursday Again, light northwest winds for California. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Friday, still the same. A little bit of a uh, cutoff low, perhaps developing north of uh, northwest of Hawaii, producing light, we'll say southeast trades. Get into Friday. Now on Saturday, high pressure looks to be getting established. You see northwest winds at 15, 20 knots for north and central California. The southeasterly flow for the Hawaiian Islands. We're keeping our eyes here. So we get into Sunday, and then here you go. You get the northwest winds at 30 knots. But this is all limited according to this. In fact, we'll just step this out a little bit more. All north of San Francisco this looks like if we had just a little bit more, you'd almost get an eddy flow pushing up along the coast. So we'll keep our eye on this. Certainly, this will make for cold waters in northern California, south of here. We'll see whether this wipes out the warming waters along the coast. So far, it looks okay. Surf forecast for Half Moon Bay, generally we'll say Northern California. Now here's the rub. Southern Hemi Swell gets pretty well masked. This is mainly looking at the primary swell, the largest swell hitting. You can see this is all, this would be Northwest Swell from the Gulf of Alaska. But then we see some things happening here in the Thursday, Friday time frame. Let's go drill in a little bit. Swell four and a half feet at 12, 13 seconds, that's all, and you can look at the swell angle here. It's all made, basically westerly swell from uh, low pressure in the Gulf of Alaska. But then you get out here to Wednesday, you see the period start jumping up, and again, jumping up again on Thursday and continuing into Friday, Saturday. Swell size in the two feet, two and a half foot range sort of thing. Definitely that looks like southern hemi swell, and you can see the swell angle here, 200, 199, 197. Now, the model's kind of... We think overstate the amount of west in this well. I think it's going to be more like 185 or even less. And then we get into Sunday, and then the wind swell takes over. No big surprise. Then we go down to San Diego. Now, this is all protected from northwest wind swell in the swell in the Gulf of Alaska for the most part. Surf heights in the two to three foot range, and then building to five feet as we get into Thursday and Friday of this coming week. Let's examine the details there. Uh, you can see all this is looking at the arrows or you can look at the numbers all southern hemi swell you can see it getting progressively more south angled swell heights in the two to 2.2 2 foot range then building to two and a half feet to three feet on thursday three feet at 16 to 17 seconds from a very south angle you know where to go to get that looks like definite swell 
North shore of Oahu, more swell from the Gulf forecast, eight foot surf, slowly dribbling down. And then on Thursday, that next little gale produce maybe some six foot surf. Looking at the details, swell seven feet at 11 to 12 seconds, slowly fading down. Then Thursday, the next little pulse, theoretically at five feet at 11 to 12 seconds, fading down from there. Probably the last blast of winter for the North Shore, but considering that it's going to be, oh, May 18th or so, that's not too bad. And then we go to the south shore of Oahu. We're actually using Maui because of the, the location of the, the spot check for the south shore of Oahu also picks up a bunch of that northwest wind swell and sort of makes things look bigger than they are. So this is probably the more conservative view, one and a half foot, maybe to two feet with luck. Um, swell size is one to one and a half feet at 12 seconds, maybe a little 14 second pulse here and there. So background rideable swell, but nothing significantly large. And that gets us to the long term outlook. What's going on with the Madden Julian oscillation and the El Nino Southern oscillation? These two oscillations, varying anywhere from a month or two in length to a year in length, really determine the long term surf and weather outlook for the Pacific Basin. So we're going to start with the Madden-Julian Oscillation. It's this periodic weather oscillation that has two phases, an active phase and an inactive phase. The uh, active phase is effectively a low-pressure system. The inactive phase, a high-pressure system. The active phase will be on one side of the planet at any point in time with the inactive phase on the other. They rotate uh, up opposite each other from west to east on the equator around the planet. We're very interested in when the active phase starts moving into the West Pacific because it does two things. One, it starts uh, dampening trade winds in the West Pacific, which in turn sucks warm, moist air up into the atmosphere, up, in, up to the jet stream level, and that in turn feeds energy into the jet stream, which in turn helps feed the development of gales. And when we looked at the uh, jet stream charts earlier, it's they help dig out troughs. That energy helps dig out troughs, which of course creates low pressure systems, which ultimately can result in surf. The other thing is that dampening of the trade winds, especially in the West Pacific, what that allows is warm water that's normally balled up all in the West Pacific, driven by easterly trades on the equator, allows them to start flowing east. They flow not on the surface of the equator, but underneath the equator. They follow the thermocline down about 150 meters under the ocean surface, the whole way across the Pacific. It takes about three months for that ball of warm water, known as a Kelvin wave, to get from the West Pacific, eventually erupting over the Galapagos and into Ecuador. And you go, well, why does that matter? Well, eventually it's going to erupt there to the surface, create a warm water slick on the ocean surface. If you have successive active phases of the MJO that create successive Kelvin waves, that building of warm water in the East Pacific on the equator will start creating a lot of evaporation. And that, in turn, can change what's known as the Walker circulation. And I'm not going to go into the details, but effectively that sets up the start of El Nino. And that's exactly where we are. We're watching a Kelvin wave making machine, multiple active phases of the MJO. I think we've had three or four of them now in a row since late December, create buildup of warm water off Ecuador. And this is what's feeding all the hype around a developing, not just a El Nino, but a strong El Nino. So let's examine the evidence around that and see um, if we can agree or disagree with that theory. All right, so start off, we're going to start with basics. We're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO in the Pacific. Again, the active phase of the MJO can dampen trade winds. So we're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator right there is zero that's the equator this is the far east pacific this is the far west pacific that's new guinea there there's the date line right there these arrows are just five day average wind speeds from the buoys looking at the arrows the longer the arrow and the direction tells you what's going on so easterly trades pretty strong in the east pacific uh easterly trades pretty strong in the central pacific easterly trades pretty strong we'll say moderate to we'll say moderate actually over the 
west Pacific. But it's not the actual wind speed. It's the anomaly, the difference from normal compared to what normally is happening this time of year over, let's say, the past 30 years. Okay, because just little anomalies in the strength of those westerly winds can help set off a Kelvin wave. All right, so looking at winds, at the anomaly winds in the East Pacific, well, they look pretty normal. I don't see in either an east or a westerly arrow there. In the Central Pacific, we actually have westerly arrows. That's a good sign, suggesting maybe something going on there. Now, in the West Pacific, we call it the Kelvin Wave Generation Area, from as far over here as you can go and still be in the Pacific to about 170 west. So right in here, this area, five degrees north and south of the equator. That's the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. But we have weak easterly winds today, at least according to this. Now, remember, this is a five-day mean, so it takes about three days before, if the winds were to change over here, before it starts registering here. So this is really about at least a three-day look back. And I say that because let's take a look at what's been going on in the West Pacific for the past five days. This is the same sort of thing, the east-west component of the wind, but and it's the anomalies, not the actual wind speeds, but they color code it. So the blues are easterly anomalies, stronger out of the east than normal, trades. The oranges and yellows are what we're interested in. Those are westerly anomalies, and this is the Pacific Basin, South America, Central America, Hawaii right there, New Guinea there, the equator right there, and the dateline right there. So the area you want westerly anomalies is 5 degrees north and south of the equator right in this area. That's where you get a, cre a Kelvin wave created. It doesn't happen over here because the warm waters have to follow the thermocline down, okay, to make it the whole way across the Pacific. And the thermocline is very... Uh, uh, shallow here. There's a lot of warm water here. And on May 8th, we see westerly anomalies there. May 9th, westerly anomalies building. Continuing on the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th, it looks like the active phase of the MJO is starting to build in the West Pacific. So what's the forecast for the next two weeks? All right, this is easy. 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. The wind anomaly thing. The oranges and yellows, the westerly component of the wind. The blues, easterly component. So think of the blues as the inactive phase of the MJO. The oranges and reds as the active phase of the MJO. All right, and we're going, and this is the whole planet on one chart. Dateline runs right up the middle. Far West Pacific starts about 125 West, so right there. Okay. Far East Pacific, uh, uh, um, Ecuador, about 80 West, right there. You can almost see a seam in the picture. But all we care about is the Kelvin Wave Generation Area, and this is past history. This is the forecast. So this area from right in about here. Now you look back in time, you see blues going from West to East over time. That would probably be the inactive phase of the MJO. Then we see in the beginning of May, westerly anomalies, but these are all in the Indian Ocean. But then you see them, well, the far west Pacific starts right there. So starting even back a week ago, westerly anomalies trying to get a toehold in the west Pacific, starting the 15th of May, strong westerly anomalies forecast holding pretty much the whole way through the next two-week window. Sure looks like the active phase of the MJO is coming, and with that, given the just eyeballing this wind speeds from the GFS model, this suggests probably another Kelvin wave being generated. Good news. All right, looking at two weeks again, this is a different component. This is moisture. Remember I said the active phase of the MJO is like a low-pressure system. It not only dampens trade winds, but it also helps lift moist, warm air up into the atmosphere. Eventually, that moist, warm air hits cold air aloft and turns into precipitation. Uh, this outgoing long wave radiation measures cloud cover. So uh, a good approximation. The blue means less sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface, means more clouds, means the active phase of the MJO. The yellows and orange, dry air, no cloud cover, high pressure, the inactive phase of the MJO. Let's get ourselves oriented here. South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea, Dateline right there, Equator right there, 
Kelvin wave generation area right there. So it looks like the active phase of the MJO is building according to this today. This is the statistic model. Five days from now, continue building. Ten days from now, still in place over the West Pacific. But then, theoretically, two weeks from now, starting to fade as a massive inactive phase of the MJO builds over the Indian Ocean. Now, the dynamic model, the GEFS model, which is pretty much what we just saw on the previous frame, suggests active phase, active phase five days from now, holding and holding two weeks from now with the, in fact, we'll do the comparison here. There we go. The inactive phase, not nearly as strong as what the statistic model says, and the active phase holding, still covering, filling the Kelvin wave generation area two weeks from now. Let's dig a little deeper. These are phase diagrams, details for the same two models, the statistic model and the dynamic model. And how do you read this? Well, the MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean to the Maritime Continent. Think of that like Bali to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. These lines here show the previous positions. Let's see. So this would have been in April. This would be May. And then here's where we are, where the heavy dot is right there is where the active phase is today. The further the dot is outside of this circle, the stronger the active phase of the MJO is. So according to this, the active phase of the MJO today, very weak in the West Pacific. There is one, two, three runs or members of the statistic model. Two of them say the MJO just sort of staying in the East Pacific or maybe making it into the far uh, Western Atlantic and very weak. And then one completely off the chart says a massively strong active MJO over the Atlantic two weeks from now. The dynamic model probably closer to reality, is showing the active phase of the MJO just meandering around in the West Pacific for the next two weeks, and we'll say moderate, uh, moderate, at moderate strength, modest to moderate, and just hanging around in there. That's exactly what we want to see. Here's the upper level model. This, this goes out 40 days, so a little bit further, like twice as far uh, as compared to what we were just looking at, which only went out two weeks. This again shows uh, areas favorable for precipitation, the greens and the oranges and yellows, not favorable for precipitation. So the greens would be the active phase, the MJO, oranges, yellows, inactive phase. Uh, again, uh, five days each panel, eight panels, South America, Central America, equator right there, dateline roughly there, New Guinea there. So this shows moist air in the West Pacific, so a weak active phase of the MJO traversing across the Pacific into about the mid part of June with a weak inactive phase starting to build into the West Pacific the end of May, traversing the Pacific through June with the inactive phase weekly starting to build again the latter part of June. But we think this model is kind of bunk at this point in time. And then here we go, the CFS model. This is run on the 13th of May, so a day ago. Again, the east-west component of the wind, the blues, the inactive phase of the MJO, and they're highlighted by this dotted line here. You can see MJO, the black line. So dotted is inactive, solid is active. Again, date line right up the middle. Kelvin wave generation area starting about 125 west, so in this area right here. Past performance, so you can see active phase of the MJO and westerly anomalies, pretty strong one back in February that's created a Kelvin wave that is either poised to or about, well, let's do the math. Uh, let's say end of February to March, April, May, that's three months. So that's about when this uh, active phase of the MJO, the Kelvin wave from it should be arriving eh, within a week or two, something like that. Then we had an inactive phase. A weak active phase in the early part of April might have created not a quote-unquote Kelvin wave, but at least a little bit of more warm water sloshing off to the east. Inactive phase, we're out of that now. And here, now these aren't joined, but they effectively are joined. Active phase of the MJO, building over the Kelvin wave generation area, expected to go for one, two weeks. But then notice after this, there's none of this active, inactive, active, inactive thing. It just goes... There's a little bit of an inactive thing here, but look at the winds. They stay westerly or at least neutral. That's the classic 
you know, this is the normal pattern, active, inactive, active, inactive. During La Nina, it's just inactive, inactive, inactive. During El Nino, it's just active, 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 or neutral in between. And this is exactly what it looks like is starting to happen. What's that mean? Well, we've had multiple Kelvin waves already queued up pushing across the Pacific. And as you see, when we get to the surface water temperature images, that warm water, that warm water slick I talked about earlier is developing off of Ecuador. As we get into the latter part of May, it might be just enough at that time to start changing the walker circulation. Once that happens, we're off to the races. And then finally, if you don't believe a model going out five days, well, I believe a model going out three months. But you know what? This model's done a pretty good job. This is the CFS model going out 90 days. Past performance down here, the future up here. And if there was ever a big glaring red signal that suggests that El Nino is developing, you see it right here. This is the blues are easterly anomalies. The yellows and oranges westerly anomalies. And again, whole plan on one chart. Forecast here, past performance down here, date line running right up the middle. Okay, and this is just uh, from seven and a half degrees south to seven and a half degrees north across the whole planet. But again, this area right from in here is what we're interested in, this box right here. And you can just see this preponderance. Notice here, blue, yellow, westerly anomalies, active phase, inactive phase, active phase. Another active phase developing, and after this one, you see just perpetual westerly anomalies and then building in strength. And we're not even in fall yet. The MJO machine really fires up when you start getting in September, October, November sort of thing. Um, so if it's supposed to do this in June, you know that something special or at least strong is happening. Let's overlay the MJO. Okay, solid contours, active phase of the MJO. There's Here's one in January, another one that happened in February. The warm water from this one, the Kelvin wave from it, we think is poised to erupt in a week or two. Here comes another one that happened in April, so that'd be May, June, July. So another Kelvin wave in July. Now here we have yet another one here in May. That would be May, June, July, August, another Kelvin wave in August. And then if this develops in June, the end of June, we'll call it July to July to August, September, October. This will be the, you know, the the uh, the icing on the cake, if you will. So the forecast, westerly anomalies, active phase of the MJO, inactive phase in the, oh, May to early June time frame, but westerly anomalies persist. A massive active phase in the June to the halfway through July time frame with strong westerly anomalies. Another inactive phase, westerly anomalies persist. This is the classic strong El Nino pattern you'd want to see. Now, we overlay the low pass filter. This is the shows the a bias towards either high or low pressure, and we're just focusing on the Pacific Ocean. Now, you see back in January, this dotted contour is the high pressure bias. This is the La Nina signal. It was smack centered for three years over the date line. It has moved east. It's over the East Pacific right now. And as we get into August is basically supposed to be inland of California. While the low pressure bias, which has been in, in over Indonesia, typical La Nina thing, low pressure over the Indonesia, high pressure in the Pacific over the Dateline, you see it encroaching more and more off to the west. That's what's supporting these perpetual westerly anomalies. And then building with one, well, right now, two contour lines, two, three in July, and I wouldn't be surprised if we get into four as we get into the fall, and centered at that time, pretty much just due east of the date line. Strong El Nino signal, if there ever was one. Not much more to be said. All right, we've talked a lot about Kelvin waves. Kelvin waves moving east and their effects on the atmosphere, but can we actually see a Kelvin wave? The answer is more or less yes. Okay, we're going to start by looking at the TAO, TAO buoy array. This is exactly what this buoy array it was set up and established, funded. I think it was after the 82 El Nino. They went out there and they started dropping buoys across the equator. 
These are the anchor lines on those buoys. The X's are actual sensors that are that are strapped to the anchor lines at fixed intervals. They're used to see literally the passage of warm water moving from west to east, Kelvin waves, okay? So this is just the actual temperatures. You can see the 29 degree isotherm, which this is 29 degrees centigrade. That's very warm water. It was back at 180 last week. It's bulging off to the east at about 177 or 178 west now. The 28 degree isotherm, it was sort of tucked up here at about 145 west and then dropped down. It's now getting deeper. The 26 degree isotherm or the 24 degree isotherm right here, pretty deep, a lot of warm water. You can see it. This is the isotherm line. So if you get the active phase of the MJO over here in the West Pacific with westerly anomalies, it takes warm water like this. It starts falling south, then follows this line across the Pacific, eventually erupting up that way. Now, this is just the mean temperatures. The anomalies, again, this word anomaly, difference from normal for this time of year. You can see it. The last year, this was all blue over here, cold water. Now, massive three, four, five, maybe even six degree above normal water temperatures, subsurface building. This is a Kelvin wave, multiple Kelvin waves building and just getting backed up off of Ecuador here. Now notice, this is a little bit concerning is there is not as much warm water here as there has been. A lot of it's getting displaced off to these. So you could have as strong a active phase as you want to have, but if there isn't warm water here to tap to push down in, then that would be an issue. We don't really think that's a problem, and we'll see why when we get into the surface uh, pressure, uh, surface temperature charge. But for right now, temperatures fading a little bit in the far west Pacific. Now, here's another view of the world. This uses different technology. Rather than use those buoys and sensors, it uses satellites to peer down, measure the sphere of the height of the ocean, and you can infer what's going on deep in the ocean given the heights or height differential from normal. And we see, again, that ball of, what is this? Oh, we'll do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Five degree plus temperatures centigrade. That's like 10, um, eight degrees above normal. Uh, and Ecuador right at 180. So poised to just start pushing up. We think this is Kelvin wave number two getting ready to do its thing. Give it about two weeks, and I think we're going to see something on the surface. Kelvin wave number three in flight behind that. And we think this is yet another ball of warm water. This goes further off to the west than what that previous chart looked at. So looks like one, two, three, at least Kelvin waves in flight. Sea level anomalies. This is, again, the satellite technology we're talking about used for that second image. Satellites beam radar off the ocean surface, measure its height or the amount of time it takes to bounce back, reflect off the ocean surface, return to the altimeter on the satellite. You measure that difference and you can infer if you strip out the waves, the wind waves and the tides, is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal? Higher than normal, well, what would do that? Well, if you have warm water at depth, it expands. That'll create a bump on the ocean surface. If you have cold water at depth, it contracts. That'll create a divot. So compared to normal, you can see it right here. Here's the equator. Here's the date line. There's Chile, Peru, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there. Warm water, five degree, five centigrade anomalies. The ocean is higher than normal all through here, meaning there's a lot of warm water in this to tap and even off beyond there. The whole way across the Pacific and then here 10, 15 centimeters impacting Ecuador. And notice the spread is getting well up into Central America now and south the whole way well down into Chile. So basically you get this wall of warm water. It comes here, smacks into, erupts to the surface, but also uh, diagonally spreads out north and south because it has nowhere to go and uses its momentum. And then that will eventually start working its way up here and then spreading out on the surface all in this area like this. And we'll see some of that in a minute. 
upper ocean heat anomalies. All right, so we're going back in time. This is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here. This would be like Ecuador at 80 West, and 125 West is about as far as you can go west without being in the Indian Ocean. Warm water, typical in the far West Pacific. Now, this is during the La Nina year. This goes back a year, May of last year. Cold water, little Kelvin wave made it across, but not enough. Massive upwelling response. The inactive phase of the MJO, much stronger than the active phases. Keeping cold water in control. December, little baby Kelvin wave almost made it across the Pacific. But then in January, another Kelvin wave, another Kelvin wave behind that, at least one more there, and yet maybe another. It's just a flood. You see literally, I talk about a flood of warm water moving across the Pacific. That's what we're going. You can't even discern one Kelvin wave from the neck. It's just like someone turned on a hot water spigot or fire hose and aims it at Ecuador, and this is the result. And then, of course, that changes the whole upper atmosphere and then greatly increases our chance for surf by feeding energy into the jet stream and feeding the storm cycle, both in the northern hemi and the southern hemisphere. All right, so what's going on on the ocean surface? And uh, like I said before, the dam has broken. Warm water is continuing to build. So let's get ourselves in Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, Hawaii out here, the equator right there, the Galapagos right down in there. This is multiple images semi-stitched together. So we have our warm pool off of Ecuador. Not as warm as it was a couple of weeks ago, but still quite warm indeed. Now that warm water is the first and maybe the second Kelvin wave erupting in this area gurgling upwards. That in turn starts shutting down the persistent they, I would call them trades for this area, that south flow weakening it some, so you don't get the upwelling and warm water builds. Then the trades, you got high pressure here, high pressure here. The trades start dragging that warm water off across the Pacific. And we've been steadily watched. So this warm water pool was just right there, and then it made it to 120. Last week or two weeks ago, is like at 135, and now it's at 140 west, and 150, almost approaching 150 west. So the larger this footprint become, becomes, the, the greater its impact on the atmosphere above it, the stronger it gets. So, And we already know there's more Kelvin waves coming. There's a big one that we think isn't even erupting yet and is going to start here in the next week or so, and then that in turn will just keep feeding this warm pool. And notice the warm water is already working its way up to Cabo right now and south down to somewhere into Chile, something like that. Not too strong of a single signal there. And lo and behold, warming or at least a little bit warmer than normal temperatures now for northern California down into portions of central California. But you can still see the La Nina-induced high-pressure, springtime high-pressure upwelling pattern still present, but looks like it's getting a notch cut out of it. But we think with the upwelling pattern, the northwest wind pattern that we talked about coming a week from now, some of this will get knocked down, but hopefully not too bad. Water temperature trend for the past seven days, all right? South America, Central America, United States, Hawaii, equator right there, New Guinea there. Now, you don't see temperatures here. It's temperature, now notice, temperatures very warm here, but they're not getting any warmer. They're just holding neutral. We think when the next Kelvin wave hits there, this will start lighting up a little bit. And notice temperatures out here off the, off the Galapagos. Yes, you see it here. They're warm, but they're not getting any warmer. The warming starts out at about 120, goes out to the date line. That would be from about here out to here. So, but this water has been cold for months and months. It's finally starting to warm into the neutral, if not above normal territories. But we really want to see some warming here. We're keeping our eyes out on it, I guess I should say, in the next couple of weeks as the next Kelvin wave impacts there. Also notice warming temperatures off California. It hasn't quite made it into Southern California yet, but certainly Santa Cruz temperatures were uh, quite comfortable um, the past couple of days and we expect that to build at least for the next week. 
And then the backed off view one more time. Warmer temperatures here. You notice the beginning of the El Nino warm triangle. Not super defined, but starting to develop in this area. In fact, let's go look at a little bit of history. Here's the current situation as of the 13th of May, that warming the triangle. You see it there. Now we're going to go back in time. So here's where we were January 1st of this year. Cold water in control the whole way from Ecuador out to 160 east. This is the classic cold water triangle. I mean, it's not a perfect triangle. It was more defined maybe back in uh, November or so, but we're not going to go back that far. But anyway, classic La Nina signal. Now, Put this into motion. We're going week at a time. And as we got into later January, notice temperatures warming. Weak Kelvin waves starting to erupt there. Temperatures actually spurt fairly warm there as we get into the early part of February. Now, this cold water is just a local weather phenomenon that it happens in the Gulf of uh, Mexico this time of year. And winds, offshore winds, race through the channel here and create some upwelling. But you see, a week later, that pretty much faded. And then as we got into March 19th, sure looks like major Kelvin wave erupting, warm water building. And the warm water from the previous Kelvin wave, let's go back just a little bit, from the previous Kelvin wave here, starting to build out into the Pacific. As we get later into March, warming just building incredibly hot there into the early part of April, right about April 15th, I think it peaked out, and continuing to diverse across. Now notice there's still little bits of cooling around here. So we'll put this into motion over the next month. Look at the building and the clearly defined warming signal as of today. There's your triangle again. So it looks like El Nino is building. If ever there was a, a indication of that, that is it. Let's go look at what happened in 97 for this time of year. This is the signal May 13th, 1997. That was a very, probably the strongest El Nino we've had in, in since the 82 El Nino. And that was the strongest El Nino since before that. So in May 13th, 1997, here's the signal. Now, here's what it is today. And then we'll go back, we'll look again. That's then. This is now. It actually looks, and we've been seeing this before, that this year's El Nino is stronger earlier than the one in 97. The question is, is there enough warm water over here to keep the Kelvin wave machine going? I think the answer is pretty clearly yes. Look at how much warm water there is all hiding in these islands and here over in the far west Pacific. All you need is a little westerly anomalies, active phase of the MJO, which is setting up right now to tap this warm water. It'll start falling, following the thermocline. Three months later, it arrives over here and boom, you get the magic. All right, so let's go back again. Look at 97 in May, there was hardly any warm water comparatively. Now, this is warm water anomalies, difference from normal for this time of year. If you looked at the actual temperatures, temperatures are cooking over here. They always are. But it's what this suggests is that temperatures are considerably warmer compared to normal than in 97, meaning yet more fuel for the Kelvin wave generation machine as we get into the summer and fall and those next couple of active phases of the MJO start getting their toes or their their the claws into this pile of warm water. Sea surface temperatures uh, anomaly values. We're going to start in the Nina 1.2 region. This is the area just right there where those Kelvin waves are erupting. This is Ecuador and uh, the Galapagos Island. Temperatures today 2.232 of a degree, 2 two and 232 thousandths of a degree above normal. Pretty much rock solid. Yeah, we were almost up at 3 degrees at one point there when that, that Kel the first big Kelvin wave started erupting. But it's just holding steady like a machine. The uh, um, If you're in the official El Nino monitoring region, half a degree below to half a degree above normal is considered you know, just neutral. Anything above half a degree is considered 
El Nino ish if it holds for three consecu or five consecutive three months periods. Now let's go to the official El Nino region, the Nino 3.4 region. This is the area on the equator from south of California out to about the dateline. Today's value, 0.473, ha above normal, 473 thousandths of a degree. Half a degree, like barely, what do we got? 0 0.27 of a degree more, and we're officially in out of the neutral range and pushing into the El Nino range, which seems like we're going to get there like no problem. And notice the trend from February, which was down at minus 0 0.8. And we were well below that. We were down in the one to one and a half degree range for th three years, slowly, steadily pushing forward. Sure seems like a major change is happening. Sea surface temperature anomalies, again, the Nino 1.2 region is the East Pacific. Nino 3 is sort of the Central Pacific. 3.4 is sort of Central to West Pacific. And this is full West Pacific, Nino 4 region. The zero line right here, you can see the balance of change in all of them with warm water building, 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 even as you go far across the Pacific. This shows the extent of that, the building of the warm water triangle making its way into the West Pacific from the east. That's exactly what we want to see. All these indicators are right on track for a developing major El Nino. All right, so what's going on in the atmosphere? We've been waiting for this for seemingly forever because the Kelvin wave, the active phase of the MJO, multiples of them have been creating Kelvin waves. The Kelvin waves have been moving, takes three months to get across Pacific. They've been doing that. The warm water slick is building off of Ecuador. Trades are starting to grab that warm water, drag it back west across the equator, all right? But is the atmosphere above that? Does it sense that anything is going on? So we look at this. This is the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin. Darwin in the Indian Ocean, Tahiti in the Pacific. When pressure is lower in Tahiti, the index goes negative. Today's value, minus 15.99. One day does not make a trend, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six days, and some of those quite negative, and we know there is... But at least two more weeks of active phase forecast, meaning this negative trend we expect to continue. Now let's we go back. We see after, before that it was like 15 days or something of sort of mixed bag of positive and negative. But then back in April, we had a pretty good run of negative too. So this would be active phase of the MJO going neutral to maybe slightly inactive. And then here we go back to active MJO. 30-day average, this really takes the noise out of this. The value, minus 5.9. Heading negatives are heading, are at least a sign of the active phase, if not El Nino. So we've got, well, let's just look at the trend here. We've been neutral, neutral. We went negative a little. We went back to neutral. Now we're heading deep down, minus 5.9, beating anything that we had from the last active phase of the MJ. And we know there's two more weeks coming. This is a good sign. The 90-day average. So this is going back 90 days. That's the 90-day average. What's the trend? Well, we were, were positive. So that's weekly La Nina-ish now heading negative for the first time, well, about three days ago, minus 1.12. Let's graph this data out. It makes it easier to see. Here's the 30-day average of the SOI. You want to see negative numbers if you're in El Nino territory. Here's zero. Back January 2021, so was that two and a half years ago, We the downward spikes are the active phase of the MJO. The upward spikes are the inactive phase. You can see inactive, inactive. The inactive phases trumped or beat the, in the active phases every time, and the index ended up sky high until about January 2023. And now look where we've been. It's just nothing but active phase, active phase, active phase, active phase, active phase, pushing the index down into negative territory. And we're still in the active phase and two more weeks of it to come. We expect we're even going to go negative from there. And then looking at the forecast, well, we don't ever really go inactive. We sort of sit neutral for a while. And then we have yet another massive 
uh, active phase of the MJOs somewhere in the July time frame. It certainly looks like the trend is heading downward instead of upward as it's been for the past three years. This is exactly what we want to see. So, where we go from here? Sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4 region. Oh, uh, that is the official El Nino monitoring region from the CFS version 2 model. Today, temperatures according to this in May are we're right on the cusp, but let's say a half a degree above normal. Where are we going from here? Well, you can read the line, sure enough. Temperatures, now this is raw data, theoretically going up to two and a half degrees above normal. That's definitely super El Nino territory. That would be in November, pretty much holding into December, and then slowly fading from there. Now let's go look at the more conservative view, the PDF corrected, which is probably closer to reality. Still temperatures by July to 1.1 degrees, clearly in El Nino territory, and only going up from there, theoretically meet, making it to about 1.85 or 1.9 degrees. Um, I, that seems a little conservative. I think we're going to be up in the two degree range, something like that. But it's still very early in the game. We'll just keep our eyes on it. But all indicators are El Nino is building. So for the immediate future, a little bit nor more northwesterly swell for, uh, for Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast, uh, California in particular up into Oregon. But that fading, a whole string of very south-angled southern hemi-swells also expected for California into about the next week or so. Then after that, looking at the forecast, well, swell machine dies off. Now we're talking about this building, El Nino, and you go, well, where is all the activity? Well, again, or the warm water is building, the foundation is building, the house isn't built yet. The atmosphere, we just looked at the Southern Oscillation Index, is just starting to sense that El Nino is getting a grip. We're thinking that somewhere about yeah, mid to late July, the atmospheric signal of El Nino will start being known. And at that time, we think the Southern Hemi swell machine will really start waking up. And that also happens to coincide with a major active phase of the MJO scheduled for that time. So if you got business to take care of, things to go, don't, don't freak out too much because you're missing swell right now. Because I think you'll get a plenty of opportunity as we get mid to late summer. And then the fall season, we think, is going to start off with a bang early and just go upwards from there. Again, all a guess, all speculation, all assuming the models know what they're talking about, but all indications are a strong El Nino is developing, and that's exactly what we want to see. Hope it's not too strong because the downside of that can just be horrendous stormy conditions both in Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast as you get into late fall and, and winter, and we don't want to see that. So it's kind of razor's edge here. You want big storms, but you don't want the weather that comes with it. That said, California, a little bit more rain as we get into uh, winter would probably be a good thing. Uh, Ski-wise also... If the El Nino develops as forecast, the jet stream tends to really dip south. That tends to favor southern tier states for snow. So just keep that in mind as you're considering what your snow chasing strategy will be for the coming winter. Also of note, though, the uh, snow levels tend to be quite a bit higher than in certainly than in this past year. So take that into consideration. All right, that's the video for this week. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. We'd appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments, write them up. We'll be sure to reply. If you're thinking it, 10 other people are as well. If you want to make a small donation, use the super thanks bit button. And other than that, we'll do the video next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching. Go surf and have some fun.